absolutely. <laughs> there is another like dimension beyond the third dimension that is starting to come through. And I've seen it for a while, but okay, here it is. I'm there. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna like show you. Like, just here's this. You can clearly. It's been a minute. What do you say we take a real ride into the world you can't see with your eyes? Can you see that pool there? Yeah. What am? Tell. Okay. So, Randy. Okay. So, what am I looking at on the screen? I've used over 10 cameras, cell phones. It happens on cell phones. It happens on regular cameras. It happens on anything except cameras. Like the expensive cameras have an infrared filter, which that's the whole thing. These are in the infrared light spectrum. Here's one of these other photographs like that. That's, those are thousands of them there. Wow. So wow. many that's blocking out the, the, the houses across the street. I mean, it's it, hard to see. It's, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's unnatural what's happening in the... I mean, there's just no, there's just no natural explanation no. for what's going on no, this in the footage. Is, this is supernatural. Let's just call it what it is. <laughs> this is not normal. 99% <laughs> of visible light uh, is not visible to us. We only see less than 1% of the visible light. So 99% is hidden from us. This actually gives me access to that other 99%. Shh. Now let me let you in on a little bitty secret. This place, this little bitty place that we call reality. Okay. Okay. So the tallest thing around there is about 15 feet tall. Yes. 20 feet max. Now, let me show you. They're looking in infrared. That these things occur, right. that what you'll be able to see in the sky only occurs in uh, in infrared. At, at his house, Tom told me he said when he was with when he was at the telescope the last time, he said there's monitors all over the place, and then he said in the off to the side he could hear the scientists talking. Check this out. This is that same location. This was now. Just prior to that. <laughs> okay, so what is it? And he said they were complaining. He said if we could, we could see this thing if there weren't so many damn UFOs in the way. Of what? Something coming in the sky? He felt they like they were looking for something, and he didn't know what it was they were looking for. But the fact is, they were used to seeing clusters of spaceships all the time. This place, this little bitty place that we call reality, is couched inside of a much larger and far more complex reality. In fact, it is that larger reality that is moving upon constantly this little place. Yeah, so this thing in the sky uh, shouldn't be there. Yeah, because I'll show you, this is, uh, there, there it is right there. That's what it was. That's right after that. This is literally uh, seconds later. Okay, and again, that thing that they use the acronym Lucifer, where they're uh, looking for their fallen star. A hidden yeah, quest for a coming that. fallen star that pulls. Lucifer actually means light bringer. So that's that was their loose interpretation of it, but it is a very evil connotation. Okay, so something has appeared in the in the literally kind of expanded into the sky. And it's got like yeah. a geometrical shape, and it's made of light, and you capture the thing on film, <laughs> and it's just hovering. Oh, there's more to it than that. And much larger than all of that, when you breathe your last, when your body falls, you step immediately out of this place into that larger dimension. I'm like, hey guys, where are you? Mm -hmm. There they are. Oh that's my gosh. Like, that's a third. Okay, okay, this is and this is this morning. And this plasma field can just show up instantly. That's the part I want to get across. Okay, and so all yes, and just to be clear, fun. all of these dots that I'm looking at, these are orbs in the sky over your house. Yes. Either heaven or hell. But don't take my word on any of that. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Here's the show. Okay, so Boom. Wow, bum, wow, the sky bum, is, bum, is just full of them. Bum, bum. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Allow me to prove it to you. I mean, it's really, and it's the only stereo telescope that powerful in the world that I know of. And it's pulling a third of the stars with it, or 
<laughs> you know, something to this effect. Pulling a lot of debris. Yeah, that's... There's no documentaries on Earth that are like the God in a Nutshell documentaries, and there's no set of supernatural documentaries like the two entities documentaries and it's not the ending of these two documentaries it's the journey and mind you the clips that you just saw that's stuff that's just a little sprinkle of stuff that i've collected over the last couple of weeks so this was taken literally five ten seconds after that other one right it's 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 not like a little time i mean you one time when Blazers was with me, I, I took him for a drive through Malibu, and I said, I, know, I think there's a Shabbat house here somewhere on Pacific Coast Highway, but I've never visited. You want to, shall we try to find it together? He goes, sure. So he's in, you know, with his laptop looking up tour codes while I'm driving him around in my Corvette. And we pull in, and there's the Shabbat house. We get out, and some young rabbi came out and, we, and greeted us, you know, really warmly, and I said, this is Rabbi Glazerson, he's an expert in the Torah codes. He said, what do you do? I said, I'm a filmmaker, I do stuff, and a lot of films about, you know, the Torah codes and UFOs and alien implants, and he just lit up. He goes, oh, I love that stuff. You've been photographing little tiny orbs that oh, yeah. zip this way and this was forever. Amazing. But but at yeah. this, we're now, we're now photographing orbs that are the size of buildings. And, and, and that's what I've discovered with the rabbis. They all are like excited because the, to them this is prophetic. This has to happen before the Messiah returns. But I felt it was important. It struck on my heart that there's things in this second that what you're about to watch, large portions, about 30 minutes worth of the end. Not all the end, but a large portion, the end of disc two of entities that I'd like to play for you, and I felt it was important to play for you. Starting right now. Here can be a larger scope of symbolism, meaning three large-scale religious systems that are askew. And from my personal experience, knowing that these things are demons, I brought, was brought by the Spirit into a deep, deep understanding of what the scriptures talk about in the prophecy in the book of Revelation chapter 16 where it talks about these unclean spirits that look like frogs. Three unclean spirits like frogs, demons, come out of the mouth of the dragon, the devil, or the antichrist, the pseudo Christ, the instead of Christ. Now remember in Egypt where the water turned to blood before there was a deliverance of the waters parting which looked with the natural eyes like it would not occur. You have the frogs which of course represent an Egyptian god or goddess in this case and out of the mouth of the beast and the mouth of the false prophet for they are the spirits of devils the frogs up here working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the whole earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And the interesting part about that in the revelation that these unclean spirits that look like frogs are actually these demons that do these miracles and how these gray alien, these little alien beings or whatever, whatever uh, fallen angels um, they are significantly being portrayed in the world governance platform right now as something that is good. When I got this assignment, I thought for sure somebody in the newsroom was joking. And it wasn't until we pulled up to this corner and saw the passersby looking up that we realized that, okay, maybe there is something in the sky today. And these demon locust looking creatures he opened the bottomless pit 
the abyss, the abuso, and smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. For, I don't know, time, time was not even, you couldn't even grasp time. And as I began to roll through this fog, I landed, um, I was standing up and, and there were pits all in front of me. And smoke was ascending out of these pits. This is in my dream. And in front of me, there was kind of this stage. And on the stage was this demon entity. And I still didn't realize where I was at or what was happening. In his hand, he had a scroll tray. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given them as the scorpions, that's another symbolic term for demons, of the earth have power, the power to sting. I'm fairly certain that what's being referenced right here with the word locus is not talking about ordinary locus. Okay, John, what is it you say? Bugs. Bugs. I'll pick up these bugs, John. Bigger than me. Oh, indeed. It gets ugly when darkness decides to take the gloves off. You're reading in those pages about darkness's last stand. It's just about time for the unveiling. What is the unveiling, John? The fight, the war. What fight, what war? The war for the control of humanity. It's always the darkest before the light comes. I, for one, am a little excited. I don't much like insects. Guy on the screen behind me hooked up to all the electrodes. Suffering from sleep paralysis, so Beck believed an entity was taking him over at night, making him go crazy, bang on doors, and one night even jump out a window. I realized that I'd done something and then I got to seeing, you know, I was cut, I had a toe, I had 6270 stitches. I come to behind our daddy's car. I heard somebody, I heard a word, somebody say, I see you later, Cody. That's the only words that I heard and I woke up, see you later, Cody. They've got him strapped down to the bed. Now watch this as the eyes open. Look how terrified he looks and the EEG machine hooked up to him shows that he is not dreaming and he's in deep sleep but yet he appears to be looking at something in the room with him speaking of things taking over the body wasn't it jay-z night and she's one of thousands a dime a dozen anymore that do this channeling of an entity but her specific claims were that a warrior spirit from ancient Times, presuming this is one of the children of the Beneha Elohim. To that which is termed, is it why indeed a new consciousness, it is coming forward. You know, I wonder if that character back in 1985 has any opinion on whether there are space aliens coming here from other planets or not. That which is coming, as it were, indeed, know you what entities that are in arrow ships? Uh, what call them? Uh, aliens. Ah, but they are not aliens. ETs. ETs. Extraterrestrial. Indeed. Humanity. Mm -hmm. That which is called they will become very much a part, as it were, indeed, of your plane. Well, my, 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 how the tables do turn. Now, I wonder if the space invaders are dropping any hints, the alien abductees. What else is there? Is there any? 
in terms of um, of other beings, what kind of beings are there? Three kinds of beings. They're different this time, not the same beings. They're not the same beings as before? No. Some are the same. The small boat is still there, but the taller ones are Telling me Elohim. They say their name is the Elohim. The Elohim, you say? Would that be like the Beneha Elohim? Yes. And who are the Elohim? The creators. Yeah, we're out here collecting genetics because we're falling apart, but we're your creators. Uh, Comes with the job, though. They've got to lie to you, right? Here's what here's what I learned from this: is that somebody is not paying attention in the demon classes. If you're gonna pretend to be space aliens, then you can't leave your driver's license in the abductee's hand. And a little a little detail that you might find fascinating. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all. Uh, uh, these are some from Sunbeam Archives. Okay. Our archives. Uh, Casper, you actually used to play with some of the very large bands. Is that is that true? That would most likely be uh, like the big hair bands of the 80s and things. Yeah, I think so. This is us during some of the expeditions and in Jerusalem. Uh, this was a uh, hobby. This was, you did this, you did this for real. I'm, I'm still doing it for real, actually. I've got a, a new album about to be released, and I've got a, a single out called In Adoration that's been number one for some time on ACT Radio Network. Yeah, uh, I was on a cast right then. I actually was flying and hit a pyramid, so sorry. You were, <laughs> you were flying? What does that mean? You, what do you mean you hit a <laughs> Yeah, you know, you think you see something like that, right? But yeah, I crashed into a pyramid, broke... Uh, this this uh, right leg in seven places slid down the side into a concrete fountain. How were you flying over it? You I had a prop on my back. And you came to take a look, take a, a serious look at the Shroud of Turin, and this changed everything. Is that, am I on track? You don't track, that's, that's what happened. I mean, when you look at the evidence, it's absolutely mind-boggling. It's astounding to me how many people there are that actually haven't even heard of the Shroud of Turin. Or, number two, that quickly write it off and dismiss it, which to me personally, I find that a little bit compelling. Or on the flip side of the coin, write it off as merely a Catholic artifact. First of all, it was donated to the cat. It's not a Catholic artifact. It's an everybody artifact. I actually, in this particular case, I commend the Catholic Church for they have spared no expense to preserve and protect it even despite the fact that a certain crowd, not saying any names, just seems to these kind of things sort of emanate from one certain crowd, was claiming in the late 80s that they had done carbon testing on the Shroud of Turin and that it had totally disproved, that it had proved that the Shroud of Turin was a medieval fraud. Boy, they were mad about it. What's funny, what I find sort of funny about this is that the, all of these results behind me, there have been hundreds of dinosaurs tested with carbon dating, and all of them, every single, most dinosaurs are unfossilized, every single one of them, save not one, tested to date, test young with the carbon dating. Same crowd, or what looks to be the same crowd, had all of these results on the screen right here censored look what they used to do particularly back then is they'd run loose with the carbon dating test and they would try and disprove anything that was it's almost became the purpose of that look we got a test a carbon test in short they had used testing that from my view is questionable and that might be the friendly version whilst testing an edge of the shroud that was sewn on after a fire during the middle age so they tested a part of the shroud that's not even a part of the shroud with a test that barely works. And this was their proof that the Shroud of Turin was fraud. I don't know what's going on with the glow sticks and the monkeys, but I'm telling you this. 
At this point, even the monkeys are starting to look uncomfortable standing next to you. More modern stuff with better testing, of course, puts it right in there at the age that it should be, and of course, coming from the exact area that it should, in fact, come from. But more than that, I study. I've been studying it for you know probably 40 years or more now. He he was beaten very badly in these images, and the score. How many scourge marks are there? It's 120. Um, at least 120 scourge marks on the front and the back. Now imagine the garden tomb. I'm going to show you my shot of the garden tomb. Recognize that? Yeah, yeah. Same thing on the. Yeah, I've got. Yeah. I know you've seen this prophecy here out of the book of Daniel, where Daniel, 500 years in advance, predicts the precise day and date, mathematically, that Jesus Christ would ride through the front gate of Jerusalem. All right, now, imagine if you're standing here and you climb up here mm -hmm. and get to the very top and go over the hill behind it. The image on that shroud, it's not paint, it's not ink, it's not dye, it's not, ink, it's not brushed on there. Showing that the cloth had been actually wrapped around the real person. In any way, and this image that's on this shroud, it is a hologram. The the blood was there first before the image came. We know that from all the, the scientific studies. You, you can see the, the mark um, where on the knee there's dirt, where he fell. Most who have researched it deeply believe it was produced by some type of radiation. It is holographic three-dimensional data that was imprinted on the shroud at that moment. Have there been people who have tried to create the image? Absolutely. But we can't get whatever precisely happened on this cloth reproduced right now with all of our technology today. I mean, if you'd asked like Da Vinci and Einstein to, to, to create some sort of image using advanced technology that wouldn't even be available for at least 500 years later, so it would have been easier for them to, you know, to have launched the Hubble spacecraft and to design that rather than to come up with the shroud. I the image appeared like a burst of energy that created the image on this shroud. The, the thing, Trey, is that the shroud is just absolutely, truly extraordinary. I mean, no one in the, in the world is able to duplicate this. There is no image on the whole earth like this one on that cloth. Same with some friends of mine, um, Call the newsboys a band from Australia. I, I was just you know, sitting in as a guest artist one night, and I walked off stage and it was been about like '98, I think. And uh, like, we just played in front of like 10,000 people, and so you know you, you can get a bit of adrenaline going when you've got a big crowd like that. But yeah. uh, it was a couple of hours later, I realised something was amiss, and I ended up in ER. And they told me I was going to die of incurable heart disease. So we got some lanterns, and believe it or not, if you're able to actually go on the other side of this and above it mm -hmm. and get into the monastery, there's a walkway between the structures where there is an entrance into the ground. But when I stopped playing my guitar, it was almost like the Holy Spirit filled in places that I stopped playing and, and so some of the praise band guys because I have that um, reputation of being a good choice of guitar guy since I was on Atlantic Records all these years and so they turn around going wow what's Casper doing on a guitar it's really amazing I never heard a guitar sound like that and I wasn't playing at all it was just this sound that just this cosmic sound that just surrounded us. Speaking of mathematical prophecies oh, I think you're gonna like this one this comes out of Ezekiel 4. Ezekiel is prophesying Israel's time where they're going to be booted out of the land in captivity, etc. God has Ezekiel sleep on one side of his body for 40 days. These, of course, represent years. Has him sleep on the other side of his body for 390 days. Again, these equal years. This makes a grand total of 430 years. Now, the Israelites spent 70 years from 606 to 536 BC in the Babylonian captivity. This leaves a remaining balance 
of 360 little year guys down there. Now, watch this. There's a, a team of, of Italian researchers, uh, I think it was in 1995, that, that they were actually the ones that helped invent the standard DNA testing for gender. Here's an excerpt from the DNA results of the blood taken from the Shroud of Turin, published in Italy. This is what it reads. What, what is astounding about these, these genetics that they've tested from their Shroud? What, what is astounding is the fact that we've got proof of a virgin birth. The X chromosome is present, but there is no evidence of a Y chromosome. This is the expected signature of a virgin birth. That's quite an entry in the journal, Doctor. And this blood on this shroud is missing the Y. Yeah. And that's a science fact. That's a fact. We went over the top uh -huh. Joseph's you know, Joseph's garden. Yeah. We got over the top. On that walkway, an old ancient walkway, we removed one of the uh, stone sections of the walkway. Underneath is an entrance to a cave. So this is the mathematical prophecy of Israel's return to the land in Ezekiel 4. And Ezekiel lived in 600 BC. That is 600 years before Jesus Christ. Israel had spent 70 years in Babylonian captivity. So that's out of the 430 years that were prophesied by Ezekiel. This leaves a remaining balance of 360 years. Ah, but wait. God had stated that he would times that by seven if they rebelled again. They, they crucified their Messiah. I would call that a times seven. And you see the door? Yeah. See this ancient, like this, this hinge piece carved in and everything? Yes. Yeah. yeah. When you go through there, you get into some other catacombs, and it takes you deeper and deeper underground. On this burial wrapping, I'd like to draw your attention. It's not just that all of the blood marks and the intense scourgings, surgeons that have looked at this, it's amazing that he went to that. Those scourgings are deep. And the crown of thorns, you can see there's intense swelling on that. He was beaten to the face a lot. Because of the lack of compression on the back, if you laid down on a Xerox machine, you could tell that you, what I'm saying is this, that at the point that this image was made, the body was levitating. From a scientific perspective, the image was made from an emanation of multi-directional light that made an impression of three-dimensional data onto the ancient, like a photo negative, onto an ancient cloth. Notice this, a fraudster would not have known to put the nail through this part of the hand, what, what we would call the wrist, what the Romans would have called the, the that's where they would put the nails through right there and on top of this one little detail in him was the life and that life was the light unto men a light that shone in the darkness and the darkness overcame it not there's no thumbs shown on there when you put a nail through that part of the wrist, the thumb bends inward, just like you see on this image right here. You see that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Until finally, you get to some places where you learn they used to bury the dead kings in these catacombs or caves 
directly behind the garden tomb. These are 360 day years, just like you find in Enoch. Enoch had four extra days of remembrance or in any of your ancient calendars. This brings us to a total of 2,520 years of Ezekiel's prophecy for the rebirth of Israel. So if I go from 536 BC and I add in my 2520 years, it brings me precisely to 1948. 1948, that's called on the money. Now it's in that same haze of time period where you've got news articles about aliens that can't fly the spaceships. Dimensional technology, come get your alien technology. Chop, chop, no time to waste. In fact, if you were to work out the precise days of that prophecy, it would come to May of 19. 48. This newspaper right here is from May of 1948. I told you that God goes surgical with these things. We get to the base where the bones of the dead kings were gathered and all went down in some, like they bury a guy and break his bones and drop it into this area here and that is a whole bunch of bones of dead kings just beyond that wall a few feet is the garden tomb <laughs> now listen to this prophecy you have littered my tomb with the bones of your dead kings and guess what those are bones dead kings just a few feet on the other side of where he was buried. That that is a stat. So, and that's full of bones even right now. Exactly. I, I just remember dying. I mean, my body. I just remember it was. It happened very quickly. There was nothing I could do about it. And I, I remember being out of my body. I remember standing there, wondering why my body was lying on the ground, but I was still standing. I'm borrowing from my friend Casper McLeod. When I state, when you pay for something, you get a receipt with an itemized list. Every stripe, every scourge mark is on there. You can count them if you like. The king who set down glory for his friends. The king that paid the highest price to set you free. And he didn't leave here without making sure that you had a receipt. A scientifically unreproducible receipt. You were still alive even with the body laying there. So I would tell people, you know, when you leave here, you don't lose consciousness. The word revelation means the unveiling i was fully conscious but i realized i was in another dimension what is being revealed is not the spookies the goons and the ghouls the unveiling is an unveiling of the king you know before albert einstein died one of the very last men he was writing back and forth to maybe the last man was emmanuel velikovsky and clearly reading his work the claimed science crap the political funded science crap they attacked velikovsky the and had his books banned from the universities velikovsky was arguing that their timelines were all wrong that Darwinism, evolutionism were ridiculous and that he thought the universe might be electric but more than all that Einstein's pen pal Velikovsky who the political science guys were terrified of was arguing that the exodus was real 
and that he thought he could prove it. Velikovsky, he got the Pharaoh of the Exodus wrong. Good guess, though. I think in this modern age, we can do better. We're going to prove the parts that they don't want us to prove most. Your Excellency, Mr. Sam Kusia, President of the General Assembly. Your Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the United Nations. I said at the very start that this was going to end well. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank the President of this General Assembly, the Secretary General of the United Nations, for your leadership in convening on a very important agenda item. Um, in fact, there was more than an adult. There was a nurse that happened to be there named Anita, and she was experiencing the same thing, that there was no heartbeat, there was no pulse. You are looking at a miracle. By all medical expertise, I'm not supposed to be alive. On November 12, 2003, I fell dead of a massive heart attack in the airport in Sydney, Australia. I was clinically dead 45 minutes. I already had diseased kidneys from drinking for like 15 years and doing drugs, hard drugs. And I had kidney disease on top of that. So when they shot the poison in me, my kid, both my kidneys failed. In the natural world, this pastor was commanding the spirit of death to come out. And then I saw it from a heavenly perspective. I saw um, my body lying there. I saw the pastor and I saw the doctor, I saw Dr. Terry Allen. And they're around your body and you're watching this, so you're still conscious seeing them. Yeah. My kid, both my kidneys failed, oh. and I was on dialysis in the hospital for a month with no kidney function, and I just shriveled up into skeletons and bones. They put me up into the top room to die. Well, the demon pushed me to suicide myself. They find my body and they put it in the car to go to the hospital to try to see if they can save me. And in the car, I woke up outside my body. And then I flatlined. And uh, when, I, when my body jerked, I let my breath out. I heard the machines going. And I'm like, what's going on? I can still see what's happening. What's happening? And I, I recall I was able to see everything in the world all at the same time, which is uh, pretty hard to explain. They administered CPR resuscitation, and they gave me 10 electric shock treatments to my heart. The blood had coagulated already in my hands, and my arms, in my feet, and my legs. So you were seeing in the spirit at that point? I, I don't yeah, know. It wasn't with the eyes? or I, I was in my body, but not alive. It was like my spirit was still in my body, and I could see. And I saw all the demons. I thought they were my friends. Wow. And they were waiting they were waiting for me to welcome me in hell. I'm like, oh no, I can hear myself talk, but I can't move my lips and I can't move my body. And I look over to my right and there's two little gargoyle alien looking greys. There was absolutely no hope for me at all. I was just a corpse. They took my body and put it on a stretcher and carried it to an ambulance. So I started the process of uh, death. The, uh, and these demons, these creatures were around you. They were waiting for me um, above me because I was like uh, attracted out of my body. Stay. I wanted to stay because when I saw them, you know, I didn't want to die. I wanted to go back in my body, but it was impossible. I was like attracted outside. He saw demons. I saw the pit. And demons. You you saw hell? I saw the pit, the black pit open up between me and I saw the little demons next to me that I used to think were aliens, but they're demons. And the paperwork had been finished and it was DOA, dead on arrival at the hospital. Uh, so that voice, that spoke like we're speaking now. It was an audible voice. And I mean, I've been in enough recording studios. No, you can't just, you know, manifest a voice of the thin air. What did these creatures look like, Alan? Well, they didn't look at all like I saw them when I was down here. Okay. They look horrible. You can think about the worst uh, good uh, special effect in Hollywood of you know 
ugly demons and uh, it's like one million more it's it, it's not human you cannot uh, express it's terrible so. like little body beans with little bald heads big craniums big eyes like cat eyes like demon like and little sharp teeth like little gray aliens those clips you just watched that's roughly not all of but uh, about roughly 30 minutes of the tail end of the second disc of entities that right there is disc one and look inside there look how you go through who Melchizedek is look how eye candy that is on the inside and it's not just the artwork that is that is a nearly two and a half hour bad boy right there another nearly two and a half hours there's no journey like that two disc set and of course the Enoch documentary do you know that that calendar that he has back there this is the it's like a Rubik's cube where you take one piece and everything lines up in my humble opinion that book of Enoch was always meant to be separate it was never meant to be part of your Bible in fact Enoch a righteous man he affiliates himself with the righteous another nearly two and a half hours for those who like roller coasters right in the first couple of paragraphs I Enoch a righteous man whose eyes were opened by the Holy One now, the word holy means set apart I'm telling you the picture is so much larger look buy the ticket and take the ride when all that medical science knew to do and with all that was at their disposal to administer it did not work I remember the, the pastor speaking very authoritatively and I couldn't understand any language on earth anymore and I realized he wasn't speaking to me he was speaking something sinister behind me and that thing just vanished and then I remember being surrounded by this angelic presence it was a bottomless pit of blackness and it was crushing it was like crushing my soul it was bad the heat. i knew it was hell instantly and i knew god was really instantly i was like oh no i screwed up i'm about to go to hell but in the ambulance just a corpse lying on that stretcher jesus stepped on board that ambulance and my heart began to beat it's uh... Jesus, it's God who came to save me. Demons there was. laughing, and I see the pit become a, a consuming blackness, and I'm about to fall into it, and I said, no, please, Jesus, not like this. I'll do anything, and then instantly I was healed. The dark thing, uh, when you felt it go away, so when you felt an angelic, so you saw the people, your body was here, and you saw people around you, and you felt an angelic presence around there was an angelic presence around it this is right this is right yes correct I, I, I felt this incredible light and, and the presence of angelic beings around me I, I don't know for a fact I could describe them except that they were big and the breath came back the driver was startled the paramedic was startled. I have talked to so many people, in fact, many more than are possibly in that entity's documentary, that have died and come back to life. And do you know what they all share in common, save not one of them? That when they step out of here, it's like a dimension of HD plus. And depending on how long they're there, they're either going to see heaven or hell. We're working on a battery of things right now that I'd like to keep as a surprise. But I can tell you this, you haven't seen anything yet. I will share with you this. We are, this year, 2017, in fact, even right now while I'm talking to you, we are working on the Exodus. And this isn't like other people's egg look. This is, <laughs> there's nothing like the Garden of Nose Shell Exodus. You're going to find out everything and more. 
than you imagine. In fact, the Exodus is checkmate. Oh, and Snake, too. Mm -hmm. You can feel it. Yeah, you can. Any, anything over 10 foot they claim is man killer just because it can, break, it can crush you. And just for kicks, we may have even gone snake shopping. You still come small, right? Yeah. Alright. He said when God raised you miraculously from the dead, he removed the APOE geno genetic marker for heart disease out of every cell in your body. He said that is impossible. It's impossible. He said only God could do such a thing. We're bad. After this, the doctors say they, they're... They freaked out. They just didn't know what to think of it. They're like, you're, you're lucky there's a miracle here. We don't even know what to tell you. We don't know how your kidneys are working, but they're working. So I saw the doctor kind of fly backwards and look up in amazement and astonishment saying, how did you do that? And the pastor was looking at the ground saying, I didn't do that. The Lord Jesus did that. I asked him to do it, you know, I asked God to do it in Jesus' name, and he did. Okay. They're coming up here, I'm scared. Okay, oh, oh, okay, 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 okay. Oh, I... God bless every last one of you on the other side of this screen. And for those that haven't seen the the full entity's experience. Your journey awaits. God in a nutshell dot com. And Casper McLeod has some new music out. You know, I was with him on a mountaintop one time, not long back, and we're in a little park ranger station. And they had this old dusty guitar in there, and it looked like you could see for a thousand miles across the horizon. And he, he tuned their little guitar for them, and in minutes he was playing acoustic songs. And those park rangers were, were excited on the mountaintop that day. In fact, one more thing. Why not? That behind me on the screen there is Anthony Meyer. He's the, like the hidden secret behind a lot of your the music for your reality TV shows, maybe HBO stuff, maybe the music artists, celebrities that, that you know. You know what's funny about that is that behind everything that is fruitful, truly fruitful in this world, you're gonna find somebody, at least one person, with a passion for God. Anyhow, Anthony called me up one night and he says, I, I've got this private stash of, you know, I do all of this stuff, but I got this private stash of music that I never showed anybody. Well, I shared some of it with, with one person who uh, told me that uh, well, they had the music there and it, the Lord must have spoke through it because it saved their life one night. But I never showed this to anybody and I began listening to one of the tracks, and I, I called him back. I, I said, uh, "I said, you, you, you wrote this?" And it, it, was, it was a dozen of them. And he says, uh, "Yeah, yeah. Did, did you like it?" <laughs> I said, uh, "No wonder they all want to hire you." And so, music I'm about to play for you now. I guess only maybe I've heard it person whose life was saved. I couldn't see it in a clear now all of you, this is Anthony Mott. It's like big bright writings on the wall. No matter how high I throw gifts up in the air, stick around, they always seem to fall. They say what goes up must come it. down, that's that man's that. perception. The simple words muttered like a fool. I like to hope that I could okay. just be the okay. exception instead of always following the rule. Lord, render me way less, come set me free, strip off the things that. I'm pulling down on me, my eyes closed, I can see You let me defy oh, gravity, I feel it. you Here goes another one. Here And you with me, oh. yeah oh. Oh. You take the 
change for me Now I see with such clarity I'm with you And you're with me You let me defy gravity You let me defy gravity You let me defy gravity Yes, you let me defy gravity Yes, you let me defy gravity, defy gravity, defy gravity. Yes, you let me defy gravity. Oh, my sins are feeling heavy, like some boots stuck in the mud. I simply ask for your forgiveness and feel your grace rain from above. Oh, wow. There's a camel guy. Wow. Oh, call him over there. Oh, yeah, I can't do it. I'll, I'll feed the camel. Okay. You gotta get, okay, here we go. It's a camel. Uh-oh. It's a camel. Uh-oh. It's a camel. Uh-oh. It's a camel. You let me defy gravity. I feel you. And you win me. Yeah. You take the chains from me. Now I see with such clarity. I'm with you. And you win me. You let me defy gravity, you defy gravity, you let me defy gravity, defy gravity, yes, you let me defy gravity, gravity, defy gravity, yes, you let me defy gravity, gravity, defy gravity, yes, you let me defy gravity, gravity, defy gravity, yes, you let me defy gravity. Gravity defy gravity, yes you let me defy you gravity let me defy. In my eyes closed I can see You let me defy gravity I feel you And you win me Yeah You take the chance from me Now I see with such clarity I'm with you And you win me You let me defy Gravity defy gravity yes, Yes, you let me defy gravity. Gravity, defy gravity. Yes, you let me defy gravity. God bless every last one of you out there. You know, this life is so short. Squeeze every last little bit of joy out of it that you can. God bless all of you. I mean, the God in a shell sets, they're always good. And certainly worth the ride. More than that, yes, they do look extremely good on a coffee table.